the Gospel of John. We're in John chapter 10, and we begin our study today in verse 7. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We pick it up in verse 7, where Jesus says, where the Bible says, Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. God has a flock, and God has a sheepfold. Jesus is the door that gets us into God's flock. Jesus is the door that gets people off the highway to hell and into the family of God. Verse 8. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Others had come, claiming to be God's man, but those who had a heart for God and those who truly had a heart for truth did not follow them. You know, there was something that just didn't set right. Those who love truth can be led astray for a while, depending on how slick the lies are packaged. But if you love truth and you love God, you're not going to swallow lies, hook, line, and sinker. Those who love truth, those who love God, will eventually know that it's not right, and they'll pull away. That's why he says, all who ever came before me were thieves and rocker, ro robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Whoever, or another way of putting it is anyone, anyone. So notice the invitation is for anyone who wants it. If you enter through Christ, you will be saved. And it's open to anyone. But bear in mind this one very important thing. There is only one door. There is only one gate. And that's Jesus Christ. Receive Christ, and you get off the road to hell. He's the only way. 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus is the good shepherd. In contrast to him, there are thieves or false shepherds. The thieves refer to spiritual frauds. They come to kill, steal, and destroy. They rob people of the joy that they could experience in Christ. They are not called by Christ. They are not called by God. They may say they're called to be ministers, but they are not. To them, ministry is some sort of a career. They're in it for selfish motives. 10 again. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus not only wants to give you eternal life, he wants to give you abundant life. Say, how does that happen? Well, number one, you have to be saved. You need to repent and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. But then you get 100% sold out for Christ. You fill yourself up with a steady diet of God's Word. And you will enjoy life more than you ever thought possible. You know, the Christian who is not sold out to Christ will be a very miserable person. But the Christian who is sold out will be full of joy. And that is the abundant life that Jesus Christ has come to give. 
11. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so like a faithful shepherd fights to the death if need be to protect his sheep, Jesus died to save us from hell. He did what he needed to do to protect us from eternal suffering. He was willing to lay down his life for us. 12. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. You know, sometimes shepherds would hire men to watch their sheep. But those guys didn't care about the sheep. They didn't own the sheep. They didn't care about the sheep. All they cared about was their paycheck. So if a wolf comes, well, they're running to save their life, and they'll let the sheep get torn to pieces. They don't care. And the point that Jesus is trying to make is this. There are some who call themselves ministers, Christian ministers, but they are only in it for themselves. They're in it for their paycheck. They're in it for to be the center of attention, perhaps, or they're in it for some other kind of personal gain. But they're not in it because they're called of God and because they love the sheep. 13. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. The hired shepherd is more interested in himself than in doing his job, which is caring for the sheep. And again, Jesus is talking about preachers who use the church rather than serve the church. They're in it for themselves. Not because they have a heart for God. Not because they love Jesus Christ. Not because they have a heart for God's people. They're in it for themselves. And, and they manifest their selfishness in, in different ways. Some preachers who are in it for themselves, not for the glory of God, not for the good of God's people. Some of these preachers, they will take the simple uncomplicated truths of God's word and instead of just clearly presenting them they complicate them by using all sorts of fancy speech and lofty language that doesn't help God's people that doesn't feed God's people but it sure does impress a lot of them they're impressed with his intellect I don't have anything I don't have any idea what he said but he sure is smart all about him. And then there are others who water down the truth of God's word if they think it might offend someone. Well, again, that doesn't help the people. But it sure does make the, sure does make the preacher popular. He hasn't offended anyone. They're hirelings. They're ministers of self. False shepherds. 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Very important to get this. Jesus and Christians know each other. They know each other. Christians don't just know about Jesus. They know him. If you don't know him, Jesus says, on the day of judgment he will say, Depart from me into everlasting fire. For I never knew you. Christians know him. Personally. Salvation isn't just about religion. It is about religion. But not only about religion. And salvation is not just about doing the right religious thing in the correct order either. It's not just about that. And it, and it isn't just about church. It's about having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your maker through Jesus Christ. If that's not there... I don't care how religious the person is, they got nothing. 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. And believe me, we could not be Christians, and we could not be saved if Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, did not lay down his life for us. It is his blood 
shed on the cross. That is the thing that paid for our sins so that we could be forgiven and so that we could have a relationship with him in the first place. 16. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So the Israelites, who Jesus was talking to right here, they were just one part of his spiritual flock. One petal on the flower that makes up his church. Jesus is talking about his big plans, and he does have big plans. He's going to blend people of every size, shape, color, nationality into his one huge flock called the church. 17. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Jesus went through a nightmare of suffering for us on the cross and the Father loved him for doing it. And if the Father loves him for doing that, think how much more we should love him since we are getting the benefits of that. We're the ones not going to hell because Jesus died. 18. No one takes it from me. He's talking about his life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So, no one could take Jesus' life. The religious rulers did not jump him. The Roman soldiers did not jump him in the Garden of Gethsemane and take him by surprise and haul him away against his will. Jesus is God. No murderous plans of wicked people could succeed against the Lord Jesus Christ unless he happened. He let it happen, I should say. And Jesus picked the time and the place of his death and he did it to pay for our sins. Doesn't lessen the guilt of Judas or Pontius Pilate or anybody else who was responsible for it because they did that of their own free will too. Just that Jesus is big enough and smart enough to know how to use it for good, and that's what he did. 19. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Division. And what were they divided about? Well, it says, many of them said, he's demon-possessed. Verse 21, others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. So there was division. This idea that Christ came to bring unity between all people simply isn't true. His entrance into the world brought division. His entrance into homes and into the hearts of people brings division, not unity. Oh, there's unity between those who make them or make him their Lord and Savior. Sure, there's unity there. But there's the division between those who receive him and those who reject him and it's a very strong division 20 many of them said he's demon possessed and raving mad why listen to him it's amazing to me that people could come to this conclusion Jesus was the only perfect man who ever lived he never said a unkind word he never said a sinful word. He never did an unkind thing. He never did a sinful thing. He never wronged anybody in any way. Which tells you a little bit about the depraved nature of those who claim that he was demon-possessed. How in the world you come to that conclusion is beyond me. 21. But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind. So these people recognize that what Jesus did was good. Some said he was demon possessed. Some said, no, he's from God. You say, well, I don't get it. How could some believe one thing and others believe something totally different about Jesus Christ? How can that be? Because some were his sheep and some were not his sheep. And it's the same today. It's the reason some people love the word of God and some people don't love it or are indifferent toward it it or are, who even despise it. 22. Then came the Feast of Dedication at Jerusalem. 
It was winter. The Feast of Dedication was known also as the Feast of Lights. It's not one of the feasts that was established by God himself in the Law of Moses. It was actually established much later. It was established between the writings of the Old Testament and the New Testament, about 165 B.C. by a man named Judas Maccabees. It was a feast that celebrated the temple, the rededication of the temple, after it had been desecrated by the Gentiles. You might know it by its other name, which would be Hanukkah. That's where that came from. Verse 23. And Jesus was in the temple area, walking in Solomon's colonnade. Solomon's colonnade, or Solomon's porch, was outside the temple itself. It was the area around the temple where Gentiles were, around, were uh, allowed, I should say, to mingle or to walk. So this is where Jesus is. Verse 24. The Jews gathered around him, saying, How long? Will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So here you have these Jews who are rejecting Jesus. And they come up to him and they imply that Christ has not given them enough information to form an opinion about him. Well, that's funny. Because everybody else did. Others had plenty of information to believe in him. And that's why many did. These Israelites didn't need any more evidence. They needed to quit being so pig-headed and act on the evidence that they have. Just like people today. People do not reject the Word of God or reject the Word of God because they don't have the evidence. They reject the Word of God because they're not open to truth. 25. Jesus answered, I did tell you but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. In other words, look at what I do. And you will know that I am the Christ. I'm the Son of God. Just look at what I do. How can you look at my miracles? Raising people from the dead. Healing blind eyes. Curing paralysis. Countless of times. Countless numbers of times. Too many times to number. And you come to the conclusion that I'm not God, even though I say I am? What, what would constitute proof in your eyes, if that's not proof? Look at what I do, is what Jesus is saying. In verse 26, but you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. There it is. That's the real issue. They have no interest in Christ, because they are not his sheep. And they are not his sheep because they have no interest in him. The same word that blesses some people doesn't mean anything to others. The difference, some are his sheep, some are not his sheep. 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. You know, sheep do not have to be branded. The only proof of ownership that a shepherd needs is that his sheep follow him. He speaks to them and they follow him. That's all the proof that anyone needs that they belong to that shepherd because they will not follow a stranger. So Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Which leads me to say this. Preachers who say that you can be a Christian and be saved and know Christ and not have any interest in obeying Him are liars. They are hirelings. They are false prophets. They are false shepherds. His sheep follow Him. 28. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. If one genuine Christian ever went to hell, then Jesus Christ would be guilty of breaking a promise, and that simply is impossible. 
Jesus has promised that no sheep of his will ever go to hell. 29. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Tremendous promises here. You know, as if the hand of Christ wasn't strong enough to keep us from being lost, God the Father is there also. And he also guards us. God the Father, God the Son, both have you in their grip if you're a Christian. You're not going to hell. No way. Not if you have faith in Christ. Not if you are trusting Christ. Now, a person can cease to have faith in Christ. Well, then you're no longer his sheep. But as long as you're his sheep, you're safe. 30. I and the Father are one. Jesus is equal to the Father in every way. Both are God to the same infinite degree. 31. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. The only people who doubt that Jesus claimed to be God are the theological liberals and guys like maybe Kenneth Copeland who push their twisted views of Jesus as proof text for their heretical teachings. They're the only ones that deny that Jesus Christ claimed to be God. The Jews certainly knew he was claiming to be God. That's why they want to stone him to death. 32. Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? So they had their arms loaded and cocked. And they were ready to fire stones at Jesus Christ. But before they could throw, Jesus asked them, He asked them, Which one of my good works have angered you so much that you want to kill me? Well, look at their, look at their response to that. Look at verse 33. We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So they accuse him of claiming to be God, and they were correct. He did claim to be God, and he didn't shrink back after it angered them either. Jesus is who he is, God. Whether anyone likes it or not, that's who he is. 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. So Jesus here, he quotes Psalm 82.6, which is in the Old Testament. Psalm 82.6, where the judges of Israel, human beings, are called gods. Now, of course, they're not literal gods. However, because they represented God in their position as judges, they were called gods. They were supposed to pronounce guilt on those who were found guilty, and they were to protect the innocent, and so they were called to represent God's justice on earth. That's why they're called gods. So, in light of that, verse 35, Jesus says, If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? So the Jews applied the term gods to humans who were nothing more than spokesmen and judges on behalf of God. They didn't see anything wrong with doing that, so they sure should not be bothered by Jesus, who really is God, claiming to be God. That's what Christ's point is here. Why are you bothered by that? Why are you bothered by that since I really am God and I've proven it? Something else in verse 35 that we can't overlook. I've told you in the past, I love scriptures that talk of scripture. He says this, Jesus says, If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus says the scripture cannot be broken. That's his view of holy scripture. It cannot be broken. Every word, every syllable, every letter is etched in eternal stone. If the Bible says it, it's true. If the Bible predicts it, it will happen. 
If the Bible says it's right, then it's right. If the Bible says something is sin, then that's what it is. Jesus believes there are no errors at all in the Bible. And that should be our position, always. 37. He says, do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But, he says, if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. In other words, if you don't believe me because of my words, then for sure you can believe me because of what I do. That's in contrast to people today who say they are Christians but don't live any different than the lost. They're asking you to believe that they are Christians because of their words, not because of their actions. That, don't buy it. That is the exact opposite of what Jesus says. Anyone can talk like a Christian. The real test is the lifestyle. And of course, confession and repentance when we fail, because we all fail. 39. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Well, the Jews realize that instead of backing down on his claims of being God, he argued to strengthen those claims. And that's why, again, they tried to arrest him. And again, they fail. But they just won't give up. 40. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed. So Jesus' three years of ministry are coming to an end. And he is ending them where he began them. Right where John baptized him. 41. And many people came to him. They said, Though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And what a nice compliment to the ministry of John the Baptist. You know, his ministry was not flashy. There was no sensationalism. He was just a preacher of the word of God. That's how he was. His ministry, there was no flash. But it was true. There was no sparkle. But, there was, but it was true. He spoke the word of God and everything he said about Christ was true. 42, and in that place many believed in Jesus. And you can bet they paid for their faith in Christ. The leadership made sure they paid. In every generation there's a remnant of people who want forgiveness of sin and fellowship with Christ, even though it means being rejected by the world. We'll pick it up in chapter 11, verse 1 next time. Until then, so long everyone.